So I am actually the first female in my family to graduate from a university. If you really want to grow in your career and grow as a leader, you have to have an opinion. My project got the highest score and I'm not afraid like uh, to say like I failed my interview. Actually, one of the things I learned at Google that a lot of my peers actually failed their first interview too. Mm. And this is going to sound very bad. <laughs> but I'm gonna say it. Hi friends, welcome to my channel. Today we have a really special guest, Sundas, who needs no introduction, but I'm gonna ask her anyway. Sundas, can you tell me a bit about who you are and what you do? Awesome, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your channel, Mary. Uh, a little bit about me, I work in data science. I'm currently at Google. Uh, previous to Google, I was working at Amazon, so I have like about 10 years of experience working in tech and data science. And I come from a non-traditional background where I didn't go to school for, um, computer science or data science degree. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I do today is I learned on my own uh, after accidentally discovering data science. If you could turn back the clock, is there anything you would do differently? What advice would you give your former self? If I could go back, I think there is a better way of doing things versus there is like a straight path and then there's a zigzag path. Mm -hmm. I took the zigzag path <laughs> and by straight path, like, I mean like traditional route to data science that is uh, going to college, getting a degree. So a little bit of background on me. So I am actually the first female in my family to graduate from a university and first female to actually be working in a corporate environment. And in my family, uh, we didn't, I didn't grow up with a computer. So when I decided to, I have a six year gap between my high school and my university. So when I decided to go back to school, the obvious thing that stood out to me was like business school. I should go to business school because my dad was a businessman. So I was like, okay, let's go back to business school. Uh, let's start with business school. Um, anyways, I went to business school and then business school, they make you take like certain classes. Like you have to pick a minor within business school. And one of the classes I took was about information systems. And that's when I realized like, this is exactly what I'm passionate about. That's exactly what I want to do. But it was too late to change my major because I was already in my third year. Oh, wow. So I couldn't change my major, but I didn't let that stop me. I continued with the business degree, but I started taking a lot of courses on my own online, as well as like at information school within University of Washington. And eventually got to know enough technical things that I was able to pass a data engineer technical interview and started out as a data engineer. After doing data engineering for two years, I got exposed to data science and I was like, this is exactly what I want to do next. And it's been, what, eight years since I transitioned to the data science job, probably. Even though my path was not straight, I kind of zigzag my way through like figuring out why actually what I actually do like. That's my journey. This is how I got introduced to data science. And for any of you like who is probably in a career that you don't enjoy, like one of the best advice, career advice that I got is like, if you don't know, what you're passionate about, just keep going and eventually you'll figure it out what you actually do like. And that's exactly what ended up happening with me. Data engineering was great. I liked it. I didn't love it, but I found something along the way that I love and I ended up staying in that field. That's amazing. You started as a data engineer at Amazon. Now you're a senior leader in data science at Google. How did you grow your career? How did you develop? There was one moment which was like a big aha moment. So I would do my work deliver results and move on to the next project. I would get invited to the meetings and there are sometimes there are meetings where you don't say things unless you are very familiar with the topic. Mm -hmm. And that was me. Like I didn't want to, I didn't feel comfortable talking about a topic that I'm not specialized in. And there was one time my senior manager pulled me aside and he's like, why don't you speak up in meetings? Like you get invited to the meetings, but you don't say anything. I'm like, yeah, because I'm not familiar with that. So I didn't want to sound stupid or I don't want to say anything. And then he was like, if you really want to grow in your career and grow as a leader, you have to have an opinion. So that one small moment was like a big aha moment in, in for me in the sense that if I really want to get promoted to the next level, first of all, I need to come prepared to the meetings. If there is a topic, I can maybe like do some five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute, like understanding what the topic is about. When you want to grow in your career, you don't want to just focus on what you're doing, but you're also want to focus on what other people are doing. You want to look at problems around you and try to like figure out what problems there are that are impacting your team, another team, another team that you can figure out and come up with a solution and solve it. In my career, that has been um, very essential that like it not just solving my team's problem, but going far beyond like at my org level, what are the diff difficult problems that my org is struggling to solve that immediately, if you solve those problems, identify those problems, that ultimately makes you a leader within the org and that helps you to build a case to like get 
get to the next level. Yeah. Now, that also means like you have to be really, really good at your work, at your core work. And these are all the things like on top of it. You mentioned when you were starting out, you did feel, you know, maybe you're like, you know, too stupid or didn't want to talk yeah. about things that you didn't have expertise in. Yeah. I think a lot of really great engineers like yourself talk about, you know, having this imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Was there a time in your career where you felt completely out of your depth? And what was your first, like, I made it, I belong moment in tech? There were actually multiple moments because there were times when I would get over my imposter syndrome and then I would feel it again. So I think the two moments that stand out was, first one was um, internship. So my first internship was at Amazon where I interned as a data analyst slash financial analyst. And every, like every internship has an internship project. And my internship project was on a new product that Amazon was launching at that time called Amazon Smile mm -hmm. and help understand like what, what are the type of customers? What is the customer frustration? What are the different channels customers are taking and how they are ending up on their purchase journey? So there were about 60 people in that cohort. I went into that project, gave a presentation and a few days later, I ended up learning that my project got the highest score among all people that everybody that was there. And like for me, getting that internship project, like getting the highest score, I was like, oh, my God, I'm actually I'm smart. Like, I'm not dumb. <laughs> so uh, and the second time it happened is when I was going into a presentation. So I used to give a lot of trainings on experimentation, A-B testing, which is one of the fields in uh, data science. And every presentation, I would spend hours and hours and hours rehearsing. And then there was this one training where I completely forgot that I have this training schedule on my calendar, 10 a.m. And it's actually 8 a.m. and I'm driving to work and I realize, oh my God, I have a training that I have to give and I didn't practice this time. And I was freaking out. And I was like, I'm totally gonna bomb this. They're gonna figure out like I'm such a failure. I don't know anything. Okay, I go into that meeting scared. 10, 10 a.m. I present in that meeting and that meeting went perfectly fine. <laughs> so that was another moment for me of like, okay, I actually do know my stuff. I'm the imposter syndrome is just like all in my head. And I think you probably would relate to it too. Like having people who look like you are successful, um, also helps you to kind of like get out of your bubble where you're like, okay, that person who looks like me, talks like me, uh, comes from a similar background as me. Like if they can do it, then I can do it too. And that's like one of the reasons I started being on social media because I wanted to people who look like me to know that like, Yes, there is space for you as well. I totally relate. And I spend a lot of time on presentations going over and over again. But I feel like ironically, the presentations where I put the least amount of effort, I think I often just feel the most comfortable when I'm giving it. So really? I feel like at some point you actually internalize information. You don't need to just like, you know, yeah. go through how to say things over and over again. Right, that's something right. that I'm still working on. So that's amazing that, you know, you overcame it and you were able to be such an amazing speaker, engineer, content creator, everything, just the whole package. So it's great. Thank you. Back at you as well. Next, I want to talk about how you were able to get into Amazon and Google. Mm -hmm. What is your secret to cracking these interviews? One simple thing I will tell you, if you can get in through your internship, literally one of the best ways to get into Fang, if like Fang is your goal, that's how I started Amazon. Now, I don't want to say like internship interview interviews are easy. They're still very difficult. Like when I remember when I had my internship interview at Amazon, I was put in a room. I hope they don't do this anymore, but like I was put in a room where there were like there were four interviews and that basically four hours I was in that room. One person would come ask the start with the similar questions. Then they will have their own set of questions. Then the second person will come. They will ask similar start with similar questions and move on to the next set of questions. Interviews are not easy, even for like internships is tough, but it gets tougher as you get into like for a full time position. So if you get are able to get through internships, like do that in terms of like getting into Google, um, that one was like the not easy. I failed my Google interviews twice and I made it on my third try. And the big learning here is like I did not give up even though I failed the interviews. So sometimes even if your interview is great, it doesn't mean that you or something is wrong with you, it's possible that they find somebody maybe who has slightly more experience or more relevant experience. And third time is when I actually crack the code. Um, and I'm not afraid like uh, to say like, I failed my interview. Actually, one of the things I learned at Google that a lot of my peers actually failed their first interview too. Mm, so, I failed my first interview too. <laughs> so uh, so the, uh, I guess like the takeaway here is like perseverance. If you fail once, like try again. But at the same time, you have to know your stuff you have to like go in prepared you have to like literally um excel at like your coding rounds you have to excel at your problem solving round you have to do a really 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 good job and that comes with like pre preparation 
like doing a lot of practice, doing a lot of mock interviews for coding, for data science, there's like also problem solving mm. uh, with stats and machine learning. So like having a lot of that done before you actually get into the interview stage can help you really, really stand out. And then sometimes there's luck involved. And for example, in my case, I was not lucky in the first two instances, but the third time I was the best candidate for the job and I did get it. What resources do you recommend for aspiring data scientists? I would say like um, lead code for coding prep as well as Strata Scratch. I personally love Strata Scratch uh, because they have their, their coding problems are more specific to data science. Whereas I feel like lead code is more software engineering heavy. Mm. So there, there are three elements. One is like uh, coding. The second is, um, and this is not specific to Google, this is in general. Uh, second is like solving problems using stats, machine learning. And the third is the behavioral part. Behavioral part is like super simple. So focus on, I'm sure like your behavioral is great, <laughs> but just like craft your stories. Uh, so you're not coming up with the stories in the interview. Uh, but then also do like time bound problems using lead code, start of scratch. And then also like do a lot of like solve problems, uh, practice with a friend, do a mock interview where they give you a problem that you actually solve in like a given time bound. And having those exercises and having that practice will help you um, be successful in the interview. So one strategy I would recommend here is that if you're pl um, scheduling your interviews, schedule the most important one that you want to be toward the end. So by that time, you have a lot of practice. What well, would you say is the number one mistake candidates will make during the interview? I would say it's not during the interview, it's actually before the interview. Today, I'm doing SQL, I'm doing Python, I'm solving problems with stats. And if for me to assume that I can go into an interview and answer interview questions, uh, I will completely fail because answering, doing your day-to-day -day work versus doing the same thing in a specific time under pressure setting is very, very different story. So uh, I guess like that's the number one mistake, just assuming that you do this day-to-day, -day, you'll figure it out. No, you actually have to craft your work in an interview setting so you can like answer that question. The second one is like ask questions, like ask good questions. And I have had candidates when they ask questions just for the sake of asking questions. If that's the case, like just don't ask questions because like I can completely see through. Let's talk about AI, the hot button topic. How do you see AI impacting the job market in the next five years? Do you think that data scientists or, or software engineers will be replaced? Will the people be replaced? No, <laughs> no, no way. But do I think like certain elements of our work will be replaced? Yes. For example, writing simple code, we probably don't need people who are just writing basic code. Mm. But here's the thing, when you work at these companies, writing the code is not just the only part of the puzzle. For me, like, let's say, if you are going to replace my job, you're gonna have to replace for example, all the, I don't want to say the politics I deal with, <laughs> which AI cannot the be. The processes. The processes I deal with. All the, the presentations and convincing stakeholders that I deal with, I would say like those are the toughest parts of my job and not just the coding. Yes, AI will be there to help us um, like write better code or write code faster, write documents faster, which is I'm currently doing today. Like I've written like one very solid doc using Gemini. And it spits out perfectly. Uh, I mean, I do make it my own because you can easily tell if something is written by AI or yes. not. Um, but I hope like those things that is going to help me make more productive, I hope they are there in the future. But to answer your question, is it going to replace our jobs? Like, I don't think so. I mean, I want to know what your opinion is. I absolutely agree. Being a software engineer is not just about writing lines of code. It's also about, you know, putting all the pieces together, learning different frameworks, using all the stakeholders, designing, system design, all that jazz. And I think AI is very, very far from replacing that, if ever. I like to joke that we'll only get replaced by AI completely when clients are able to make their requirements completely clear. Exactly. Which is never, right? Let's be and, real. No and, offense to my users. <laughs> and I do want to say one thing, like all these people who always make these bold statements, Pay attention to what's their hidden motive. A lot of these people have AI products that they want to like, basically they want AI, their AI products to be taken over by the industry. So by creating this fear mongering, they actually get to be on the news, make their product relevant. What I'm trying to say is like, pay very special attention to who is saying what and what could be their potential motive behind yeah. saying something. Yeah, I 100% agree. So I think in conclusion, I think we both think AI is a really great tool, can help streamline a lot of our coding, a lot of our processes, but it's yeah. not going to replace us. And you need to know how to use AI so you're not left behind. 
<laughs> Another thing I want to talk about is how productive you are. So for context, Sundas is a full-time data scientist at Google. She also makes, you post on like TikTok, LinkedIn, I YouTube. I post on four, five four different platforms. platforms. Yeah. Um, she's a mother. How do you do it all? How do you manage such a busy career and still create content and spend time with her family? What's your secret? Honestly, I want to say like three things. Number one thing is having a job that enables me to have a work-life balance has been life-changing. I didn't do all these things at my previous company. I'm able to do all these things now because my company cares about my work-life balance. So that has been the biggest unlock for me to have like the free time after work where I don't have to open my computer at 8 p.m. and respond to pings and respond to emails. Second thing is um, outsourcing, like whether that is like outsourcing my house cleaning or outsourcing like my yard work. Um, and then same with social media, like outsourcing editing, outsourcing uh, my inbox management and um, outsourcing other things that come with like content creation has been really, really, really helpful. The third thing I would say is like passion. So all these things I'm able to do because I'm like really passionate about it. And when I do these things, it doesn't feel like work. I actually get take a lot of energy from it. So if I'm building a new video, developing a new video, I'm actually getting really, really excited about it. And it's my hobby. Like that's where I, this is where my the creative part comes in. Um, so that's how I'm able to like navigate all of that. I want to know like how you are able to do it because you also work full time and you are able to like create content and like do these travels and like meet with people like me and whatnot. So tell us more. I would say the biggest tip is just time blocking. I didn't do this as much before university, but I, I went to MIT. I kind of had to like learn how to block out my time to survive. Just like putting on your calendar, like this is when I'll focus. This is when I'm going to study X, Y, Z. This is when I'll meet up with people. I've chose Sun as my calendar and this trip. It's like literally just like full to the brim Love of it. everyone I'm supposed to meet, yes. all the things I'm supposed to do. That has been the number one tip that has helped me survive all these years. <laughs> Plus one to the calendar, because that's exactly what I do. Uh, I have my doctor appointment on the calendar, my parent teacher, kids parent teacher meeting on the calendar, my workouts every day on the calendar. The time where I'm actually going to sit down and focus is also on the calendar. I know a lot of people recommend books and podcasts that help with time management and productivity. Is there one particular one that's completely changed your mindset? This book um, called Essentialism basically teaches you by saying yes to everything is not right thing to do. When you say no, people actually dis and you make very conscious decision. If it's not 100% yes, it's a no. And people actually respect you more when you say no. Mm. And honestly, I have tried that at work, outside work, and it has not only saved me so much time, but it also co makes me like think more consciously before I say yes to anything. Highly recommend it if you are like somebody like me who loves to please people. I totally relate to that. One of my mentors at work actually told me at some point, think about the work that you are volunteering or assigned to do. Is it going to help you grow or develop in your career? Right. If not, then try to push back or think about the pros and cons. Right. Because, you know, as a new grad, I was literally like, like any work, give it to me. Like I'll like volunteer. I did so many different things. I did 20%. And I think that in retrospect, if I could do it back, I would guard my time a bit more. Obviously, you know, you cannot say no if your manager like wants you to do a critical project. Right. But if it's something that is like less relevant to you, you could perhaps ask to reassign it to someone else. Or you can ask to kind of shift around the priorities so that right. you get to do it when you are less busy with more important work. Yeah. That is something that really, I think, has helped me in my career personally. And it's great to see that this is also a good trait that you have picked up on. Over yeah, because if you don't do it, you, this is literally a path to burnout, <laughs> saying yes to everything and not having boundaries. And finally, I want to ask if you could give your younger self a piece of advice. Yeah, that's a great question. If I could give my younger self one piece of advice is research all the different fields out there just don't go into one field that seems familiar to you uh, talk to people reach out to people and this is gonna sound very bad <laughs> but I'm gonna say it be practical when you're picking your career because at the end of the day work is just a means to make money and I agree like you should be passionate about your work but it doesn't have to be like hundred percent passion maybe it could be like 60% passion and 40% practic practicality. If you have to make some decisions, take passion into consideration, but also be practical. Uh, but you've already made those decisions, like think of it like a sunk cost and move on and try to see like what you can change in the future. Thank you so much for all of your tips and insights. This has been wonderful. Please follow all of Sunnis's many, many channels. She has so much cool, useful advice. And if you enjoyed this, feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.